Is it Matt in a wig? No, it's Cooper, and this is your second pre-recorded machine learning lecture. Today, we're going to be talking about regression, dimensions, and all that jazz. So, first, let's recap what we learned last time. So first, we saw that machine learning is a subset, a specific subset of AI. And we also defined ML, uh, the way we define it for the class is defined differently by different people. Um, we defined it as using data to change the parameters of a model so that it behaves like some function. And there are a lot of different ways we can do all of those parts, um, but we are talking first about linear regression and we'll get into more, uh, more different ways that we can do that. So. We also learned this new notation. This is going to be the notation for the class. Again, it will make more sense um, even in this pre-recorded lecture. So we start with our inputs being x, and we notate its, uh, which piece of data it is with this superscript. So this is the first piece of data, second piece of data, nth piece of data for n pieces of data. And we also take these labels, um, as we call them, as y, and we notate them the same way. And we have that these x's, uh, like superscript, corresponds to superscript, so this x will correspond to this y, so we see that in our function we want this x input to go to this y. Um, and one specific thing that we really should note about this is that um, we are not always given these labels. In fact, when we're given these labels and we try to do exactly what I describe here, um, this is called supervised learning. And in fact, there is such a thing as unsupervised learning, where we are just given this input, and in fact, we'll talk about this in this class. Um, we're just given this input, and we have to do clustering or some other task on it. Now, with all this in mind, we came up with a nice little diagram for ourselves, which says that for each of the pieces of data, we want to feed it through the model, um, which we'll calculate using the parameters, and we want to get the corresponding piece of output data, the corresponding label from it. Um, so this is the, the diagram that we want um, out of our of our model and we're going to be using this as a basis for what we're doing. Alright, so let's look at a more genuine example than we had last time. Last time we used a very precise and perfect piece of data that absolutely fit to a linear uh, linear line, a line. <laughs> um, so let's look at something a little bit more, uh, more real. So let's say that we want to take as our input hours of sleep. So we have 1 through 12, you know, all this. And what we have as our labels from here is the score on the final. So we can see that they, they, they line up. But you'll notice that it isn't actually linear. So 1, for example, is pretty high. I guess this person doesn't need sleep for whatever reason. But you see that as we go up, like, uh, 6 is 73. So it isn't exactly proportional, and there is no line of best fit here. We can just sort of see by eye. Um, but to see it by eye a little bit better, we can actually graph it. So here on the y, we have our y, and on our x, we have our x. Um, it won't always be that way, but for right now, we'll have it that way. And we can plot all of our pieces of data. Right? And what we're doing with linear regression, like we said last time, is we are trying to find a line of best fit. So let's take some line that looks good to us. Let's take this one. It's pretty close to this cluster right here. It passes through two points. So that's, you know, decent. Um, but there's nothing holding us to this particular one. This is just arbitrary. So what if instead we wanted this one? This seems to be, it passes through three instead, which is better maybe, and it also like is closer to this one, maybe. Um, but we can also take something that is just through the middle. It doesn't pass through as many points, but it's closer to all of them in general. And then the question becomes, how do we decide which one is the best fit? And this becomes sort of the fundamental question of machine learning is, how do we best fit the data? Um, in linear regression, you know, we can see it a lot easier. It's just these lines, but we will get, um, we will get lots of this problem coming up. So let's talk about a solution, how we actually define this. And we use a uh, what is called a loss function to define this. So a loss function is some function that will determine how poorly our model is fitting the data, or how poorly it performs in whatever task we're having it do. So let's look at this example. This is just one of the lines. And what, we, what we're going to do is uh, I want you to just think about how we might measure how poorly this model is doing. We can do this naively, just think about you know, what would make sense, what would, what would be a good measurement of it. And I want you to like, genuinely uh, take just a minute or two, pause the video, and think about how you would approach this problem and what sorts of methods you might want to use, what sort of loss function you might be able to come up with. Um, this aspect of machine learning, coming up with this sort of part of it, is one of the most fun parts of machine learning because it is 
at kind of at the moment like unanswerable questions. Like we can we can come up with a bunch of different loss functions and there's no real way to say which one is the best one rather than uh, like we can only test it empirically. So I'd say really take a moment and think about it and you might come up with something interesting. Um, and, and see what you come up with. I'll give you a couple seconds, still vamping. All right, I'll assume that now you have either done it or you are not going to do it, which is fine. Um, and let's talk about one method that you might want to take. Um, what if we just take the distance of the line to each of these points? So our model is saying that for in this input, it is predicting that this is the output. So if we do that for every single one of these points, you know, we sum them up. That gives us a pretty good idea of what we're doing. Um, you can think about for a moment why that might be a good method, why that might be a bad method, but um, we'll talk about it now a little bit more precisely how we would do it, how we would define our loss function. So we're taking our data, just keep this, this data in mind, and what we're doing is we're taking the distance from each point, which we can show like that. So those are all the different distances that we have, and how our loss function actually ends up looking is like this. So we are taking uh, the difference between these points, so we have yn, which we have as being the nth labeled piece of data, which is these little purple dots are all of the data that we're given. And then we have y prime uh, of n is what the model is predicting when fed, when fed the nth piece of input data. So for example, at this point, the nth piece of data is this x right here, and the model is predicting this output. And we do this along the line. So what we're doing is we're taking the absolute difference between the two, so it doesn't matter which side of it it's on. We're taking the absolute difference from them, we are summing them up, and then we are averaging them. So this we end up calling the mean absolute error. We're not going to continue using this very much into machine, into like the neural network stuff, um, but this is absolutely an important thing to keep in mind, and this is an important principle to keep in mind. Um, so, you know, thinking about how we might design these loss functions. And in fact, I'm going to give you another example now, just so you can see how we can contrast different loss functions, how they can actually like cause us to do different things in the end. Um, all right. So the question now becomes, how do we minimize this loss? Because we are defining some metric of how well our model is doing. Fine, we can look at a model and we can say, okay, this is doing X well, but how do we decrease that number? How do we, like, we don't want to just test a whole bunch of different lines and then see which one happens to fit best. We want to have some, like, algorithm to determine what the best possible line is given some loss function. Um, and we're going to breeze over that a little bit, and we will talk about it in a second, um, but it is a nice, there, there is nice ways that we can do that sort of thing. And in fact, there are very nice ways we can do more complicated things. So, Let's look at a different loss function first, um, which we are going to call mean squared error. And I let you guess what that means, but let's let's look at it. So it's the same exact thing, except instead of taking the absolute value of the difference, we're taking the square. Again, that means it's always positive, so that is good with us. And we are looking at it, and we can think about why this is different than MAE, um, mean absolute error. And I want you, again, uh, take a second, pause, and I want you to think about why this is different from this, why these would actually have different optimal lines. Um, so I would recommend you look back at the example I just gave you, maybe even like make up some quick data on your own and try to calculate it out. Um, it might seem tedious, but it will give you sort of a good intuition for how it works. Uh, doing the stuff out by hand a little bit is really helpful. Um, you can take my advice on that if you wish. Um, so. I'll wait another second. Okay, so what we are going to see um, from the behavior of MSE is that the elements that are further from the actual values, so the places like on our example here where we have a big gap, all right, that gap gets multiplied. So that gap becomes much bigger and we weigh it much more heavily and the small gaps we minimize, they, they get smaller. So what we start to see um, in like practical application is that the MAE will prefer having outliers. It will want to have a line that goes through most of the points and it will want to be as close as it can be to there. Um, there's different behaviors for different data sets, but you can, like, you can imagine in general it's fine with outliers. Um, that's not a big problem to it as long as it can minimize uh, the average. What we see though with MSE is that if we have any big outliers, it will hate that. It does not like having big outliers. So we will actually see that the lines that we fit using MSE 
are going to be much like more average throughout the data. We won't have any big outliers because if we have big outliers, we have a huge loss. So all of this begs the question then, how do we actually find the optimal line given any of these loss functions? Um, and uh, I, I have here um, like a little prompt for you to like take a moment to try to think up your own loss function. There are nearly an infinite number of ways to formulate this, if not infinite. Um, and these are just common methods because they're very simple, but you don't necessarily need to have a simple loss function as we will see later down the line. Um, and I want you to take a moment, uh, I guess this is another pause, and think about what loss functions you could use. For example, would it work if we used cubed? Would it work if we used four um, to the power of four? And what would those different behaviors mean? Uh, so keep that in mind and I just want you to think about that. Uh, we, it won't come up very much more in this lecture, but it will come up more in general. All right. So let's talk now about how we find an optimal line. Um, so like, how do we actually minimize the loss? How do we find a set of parameters to minimize the loss? So like, oh, there's a typo. So how do we find the minimum of a function in general? You've all taken 233. Um, you've all taken calc in general. So we should know that like to find the minimum of a function, what we're going to do is set the derivative to zero, and we want to find what values set that derivative to zero. And you can think of this um, like a function, our loss function is a function of our parameters. So it takes our parameters as its input, like we feed it through the model, and then we get some output. And what we want to do is take the derivative of that, take the derivative of our loss with respect to all of the uh, all of the parameters along the way, and we want to set them all to zero, that would mean that we are at an optimal point. And it might not be obvious to see, but you can think about it if you'd like. Um, the derivative of this being zero could also mean a maximum, but we'll actually see that for the task that we have defined here, we won't actually have a maximum. Um, I'll give you a slight argument for it. We can always have a worse line um, in any case, but we can't always have a better line. Um, so we're, there will only be a minimum, there won't ever be a maximum. All right, so uh, let's let's think about what that actually means in terms of the parameters, right? So we want to set the parameters w. Um, I use w to mean all of the parameters. In our case of uh, linear regression, we'll have w and b. Um, so we see that we want to set the partial derivative of loss with respect to w to zero. And we want to find what parameters make that true. And in the case of our linear regression, we'll also have the partial derivative of loss with respect to b would also equal zero. Um, this w just stands for all of the parameters at this point. Right? So this is not a very detailed explanation. Um, there is sort of a little bit of rigorous math that goes into finding the actual line. Um, it is worth doing, and I might make a separate pre-recorded lecture just to talk about. It involves um, a nice scary thing called matrix calculus. And it is essentially just a large optimization problem. Um, you, you were taking, it is essentially just taking the derivative of, a, of an arbitrary function with respect to its parameters and setting it to zero. Um, there is a nice closed form solution for linear regression and uh, a lot of these like simpler neural network problems. We'll see, or not neural networks, not neural network problems. We'll see that when we go into neural networks and when we do um, more complicated models that we won't have nice closed form solutions. So uh, closed form just meaning that we can actually calculate it. We can use like mathematical notation to exactly calculate what the answer is. And we'll see that it's not the case in more complicated problems. Um, we can't actually get a perfect solution. We just have to estimate. Um, so we'll see that more. So now uh, let's look at a harder example. And we're going to introduce a new idea here too. So let's look at what we had before. We have our hours of sleep and we have our scores on the final, right? This is just like what we had before. And what we're going to do is we're going to introduce a new part of our input, a new aspect of our input, or as you'll uh, come to find, a new dimension of our input. So our input here now is not just the hours of sleep um, here that we had before, but it is also the hours that are spent studying. So here we have those. I don't know why I put a low number of hours studying to high scores. I think that is a uh, a little bit, I, I wish it were that way. Um, 
but maybe it maybe it is a little bit that way. But let's let's look at how we actually would plot this and how we would go about solving it. So let's look at our plot. Now instead of having our y-axis actually be our labels, we're going to have two uh, two axes that are both aspects of our input, right? So we have our hours of study here and we have our hours of sleep here. And we are going to put our points on like so. Um, so they're going to correspond to these two values here. And then we're going to actually label these. So we're going to go through and label them by their corresponding values here. So this is how we would represent a uh, three-dimensional. Uh, there are like a couple ways you could do this, and in general we can't actually really visualize this too well. We only can in very simple examples like three-dimensional. Um, but we can sort of see it like this, and we can look at uh, like these values, and when we're doing our linear regression here, instead of actually uh, so instead of actually finding like a line through it, what we're doing is we're finding a sort of topology about where like certain values are, and we only can have a linear topology for this. Um, topology just being like the like hierarchy of uh, of like space, I guess. So like that, there we'd have like this is the like this right here would probably would be the top, the highest area, and then it would decline as it goes, and we'd have to come up with some uh, linear topology map of how we do that. Um, you don't really need to understand that too much, you just need to understand the idea that we are still doing essentially the same exact thing, just in a higher dimension. If we were to put this on a three-dimensional axis, we would still be just making a line. Um, we'd be making a plane, but we would essentially just be doing the same thing. Alright, so what our model is actually going to do is it's going to take each of these inputs and it's going to predict for every single point, um, it will have a prediction of what this score is. So instead of just being a line, it is an entire, like, topological thing. So, uh, like, we'll still only be able to do a linear relationship if we're using a linear model here, so we'll only be able to have, as I described, linear topology, but we will, uh, like, actually be mapping every single point, which is a little bit different than we had before. All right, so what we learned from that is that we can have multi-dimensional data. Um, like, we can have two dimensions in our input, we can have hours of sleep, and we can have uh, hours of study. So we see, um, like, we're going to introduce a bit new notation, which is where this is finally going to make sense to you guys. So we have our x's, which are x1 through xn, right, with the superscript. And now we're going to have that any single input xq is going to have xq1 through xqd, where there are n inputs of dimension d. So we have n pieces of data here, right, we'll have n pairs of uh, hours of sleep and hours of study in our example, and then each of them are going to have some number of dimensions. So in our previous example where we have hours of sleep and hours of study, there are two dimensions, and we will have two pieces of uh, like data, I guess, we'll have uh, two individual datum per uh, x input. So we'll have x times, d, or n times d actual like numbers. So we start to see that our model, our little diagram that we like, is actually going to look more like this. So we're going to have d inputs into the model and one output um, to xq, and, or uh, yq. And what we really um, like kind of get from this more than just the input can be multidimensional is that the entirety of it can be multidimensional. So instead of just having this single y input, you know, as we have before, we can actually have multiple y outputs too. Like we can have multiple outputs from our model as well. So we're going to use the same notation. Uh, it's going to be these subscripts here. And we can see actually that c and d are uh, not necessarily the same. We do need to have the same number of data. Um, but we could have that the dimensions are actually different. So we could have possibly, you know, two inputs and five outputs or any other mechs. I'm sure you can come up with more of those. Um, and we'll see that our diagram actually looks more like this. So we have multi-input and multi-output from our model, and we are doing some function on it to go from this input to this output. And we can still do this um, with linear regression. We can still use a linear model here. Um, it will just be... Uh, not that great, um, as we'll see, but it is exactly the same process as what we were doing before. We can still just set the derivative to zero and find the optimal parameters. So this right here, this slide right here, is essentially our new paradigm of how we are thinking about machine learning for these pre-recorded lectures. And I want you to keep in mind that we're going to have um, these multidimensional things, and we're actually going to use this in the immediate next um, pre-recorded lecture. We're going to use an example where we will actually have an input and an output that are multidimensional, and we'll finally start talking about neural networks. 
So, hope to see you there. I uh, hope this uh, this all landed. Have a good day.